magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company. West, North, and South. More than 60 million Americans go to the polls to select the man they want to direct our nation's destiny for the next four years. In a grave hour of world crisis, voters speak up for freedom through the voice of the ballot box. In San Francisco's Chinatown and all across America, balloting is heavy. Streaming into the polling places, men and women from every walk of life are making our democracy work. Students are among the first-time voters. Here, one youth examines a sample ballot, determined to make his first vote an intelligent one. For the ill and aged who cannot come to the polling places, the polling places come to them. They are exercising an American's most precious possession, his right to vote, and each has reason to smile. In New York's Times Square, crowds gather on election night. As returns mount, an Eisenhower landslide finds Ike winning state after state. At Democratic headquarters in Chicago, Adlai Stevenson, twice defeated by Mr. Eisenhower, urges all Americans to close ranks behind the president. The Eisenhower victory is official. He sweeps 41 states and polls the biggest vote ever given a presidential candidate. But despite his smashing personal triumph, the Democrats retain control of both the Senate and the House. At GOP headquarters in Washington, campaign workers give the president and Mrs. Eisenhower a rousing reception. Accepting his victory humbly, Ike dedicates himself anew to the service of all Americans. With whatever strength there is within me, I will continue, and so will my associates, to do just one thing, to work for 168 million Americans here at home and for peace in the world. That is all. Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, a barren stretch of dunes, plateaus, and lifeless mountains, rolled the spearheads of an Israeli army of 50,000. Led by General Moshe Dayan, the Israelis strike, they say, to end once and for all bloody border raids by Egyptian suicide commandos. Advancing against disorganized resistance, the invaders march toward the Suez Canal on the eastern border of the peninsula. 30,000 Egyptians are taken prisoner in the desert blitz. An Egyptian flag and bogged down tanks become prizes of war. $50 million in equipment, mostly communist made, is also captured. In six days, the Israeli army overruns the entire Sinai Peninsula, taking possession of an area twice the size of Israel itself. With passage through the Suez Canal imperiled, England and France issue a ceasefire ultimatum to Egypt and Israel. Egypt rejects it. Flying from Cyprus, English and French paratroopers lead a joint air-sea assault against Port Said at the canal's northern end. The troopers leap out into Egyptian Akak. Smoke rises over the vital waterway. After a softening up by Anglo-French bombers, the seaborne invasion begins. Explaining the action, the two countries declare their sole objective is to restore peace in the Middle East. The soldiers wade ashore almost without opposition as the world watches and waits and wonders. Fighting is heavy in Port Said, where the Egyptians make a determined last stand. But the conquest of the city is completed in two days. While mopping up operations go on, Russia threatens action of its own against Israel, Britain, and France. When the three nations, along with Egypt, agree to a United Nations ceasefire proposal, the grave situation is eased. The plan calls for an international police force to preserve the peace. For strife-scarred Port Said, the agreement comes too late to prevent this desolation. Meanwhile, bickering over the police force's authority begins even before that force lands. 
Travel to the canal is at a standstill, closed by Egyptian sinkings of blockade ships. It will be six months before the waterway can be cleared. Months of danger and decision in the explosive Middle East. For five frantic days, Budapest is free, and our American cameraman is there to record Hungary's hour of hope and heartbreak. And our Russian hatred, smoldering for a decade, erupts without warning. The flames of liberty and revenge against tyranny leap high. A 16-year-old girl risks her life to remove the despised symbol of Russian enslavement. Throughout the city, Soviet war memorials come crashing down. Budapest is in revolt. With uncontrolled fury, crowds set fire to Russian flags and put Soviet books to the torch. The Red Star is sent tumbling into the gutter. Word comes of shooting on the other side of the city, and the rebels, armed now, run to the scene. A quiet park has become a no-man's land. Our cameraman is caught in the crossfire as rebel sharpshooters advancing across the square attack the headquarters of the Soviet-controlled secret police. The Hungarian patriots refuse to give ground before the withering fire from the building. They are showing the world that freedom is worth dying for. A tank moves up. Is it rebel or red? No one knows as its gun swings to point directly at our cameraman. It belongs to the rebels, and behind it, white-coated first aid men care for the wounded. And then turning on the Soviet stronghold, the tanks lead the final victorious assault. As the rebels storm the building, the impossible is happening. A handful of heroes has shaken the communist world to its foundations. They have turned the tables on their Soviet tormentors. The rebels ride their tanks triumphantly through the streets. The Russians have given their word that they will withdraw all communist troops from Hungarian soil. The victory seems complete. Cardinal Menzenti, who has suffered long persecution under the Reds, leads his countrymen in praying for an end to the fighting. The jubilant people of Budapest, flushed with the excitement of their historic struggle, surround our cameraman's car. They press closer, pleading, Tell the world we are free, we have cast off our chains. Faces white, free of fear, tell the story of Hungary's hour of hope as our cameraman hurries these pictures to the Austrian border. Behind him, Russian tanks rumble back into Budapest to turn that hope into heartbreak. 5,000 come with 200,000 Soviet troops to snuff out the torch that brave Budapest had held so high. Tears stream down the cheeks of grief-stricken refugees who must flee now for their lives. Loved ones, dead or captured, are left behind as Russia, without mercy or conscience, tries to wipe out the country that so grievously wounded it. The pathetic procession makes its way to the Austrian border, while far away a rebel radio broadcasts a last agonized plea. On the watchtower of 1,000-year-old Hungary, the last flame begins to go out. The Soviet army is attempting to crush our troubled hearts. Listen to our call. Our ship is sinking. The light vanishes. The shadows grow darker. God be with you and us. A flare arcs across the sky. Communist tanks appear. Soviet forces are sealing off the border. But before the Iron Curtain slams down, a last truck careens to freedom. their hearts, and from their flag, the Hungarian people have ripped Russia's hated symbol. The long ordeal at New Delhi begins with the worst flood in its history. India's Jumna River, swollen by a week of continuous rain, overflows its banks, marooning thousands. Sacred cows wander unmolested among the workers trying to reinforce the dirt levees. Their methods are primitive, their task hopeless. But they work on doggedly, believing that determination will make up somehow for their crude tools.
Prime Minister Nehru watches the fight to save India's capital. Refugees stream from the lowlands. Motorcycle rickshaws become makeshift moving vans. 50,000 persons flee using every means of transportation. Village after village is wrapped in a mantle of muddy water. Prayer meetings called Yaganas are held asking an end to the suffering spread by the Jumna, a holy river rising in the Himalayas. Years after the floodwaters recede, New Delhi will remember its long ordeal. Laying a mattress for the Mississippi, the Army Corps of Engineers is attempting to halt riverbank cave-ins and erosion. Each shore must be graded before the concrete mattresses can be put down. The mass of equipment contrasts sharply with the meager tools of India's flood fighters. At Vicksburg, a traveling mat boat spreads the bulky mattress made up of thousands of sections. Starting high on the bank, the prefabricated concrete cover stretches down into the deepest part of the river. Into the night, the engineers lay the mats, sometimes to a depth of 100 feet beneath the surface. Stretching mile after mile, a concrete shield to guard against floods on the mighty Mississippi. Italian firemen take over a spacious boulevard in Rome for an exhibition of aerial acrobatics. Often called upon to jump in the line of duty, the firemen perfect their techniques. The firefighter's finale is a leap for life, a five-story drop that sees one jumper almost miss the narrow slide. This man is manufacturing atomic power, using incredibly delicate mechanical hands to move the radioactive material into position. The television receiver, which is connected to a camera in the atomic oven, gives the technician a close-up view of what he is doing. Behind three feet of glass and concrete, the sensitive hands pick up a radioactive pellet barely big enough to see. The pellet is dropped into a capsule for storing and shipping. Here the unerring hands, as precise as those of the technician, break off and thread a strip of wire. Another example of progress in working with atoms for peace. Racing to beat the Arctic winter, a convoy of Navy cargo carriers plows through the ice flows of northern Baffin Bay. The ships are delivering supplies for Dew Line, the defense early warning line of radar stations strung across northern Canada. Soon, solid ice will block these approaches, and this overseas service will have to be abandoned until spring. It's a joint service effort, with Army landing craft taking over to ferry the supplies ashore. During the open season, 61,000 tons of general cargo and 12 million gallons of petroleum are landed. Unloadings go on around the clock, hampered by the fog and mud of the last thaw before the big freeze. The mud slows, but it does not stop the operation to sustain America's first line of defense. Acres of supplies for the men on due line, facing a lonely winter in the Arctic wilderness. A crippled Trans-Pacific airliner, two propellers out of control, circles over the Coast Guard weather ship Pontchartrain. After five hours, the pilot is going to make an emergency landing. Although accidents such as this are rare indeed, the pilot knows just what to do. The plane, center screen, hits the water in a shower of spray. 31 lives are in the balance in these dramatic on-the-spot films. Survivors are transferred to rubber rafts by the plane's crew, working quickly and efficiently. Although the giant Stratocruiser is broken in two, no one is seriously hurt. A remarkable feat of airmanship, 1,200 miles out in the Pacific. From their rafts, survivors watch the airliner settle lower and lower into the water. Within 15 minutes, it is swallowed up by the sea. Reaching the Pontchartrain, a child is first aboard. 
skill and heroism write a happy ending to a great ocean rescue. With a pail and a net, Dr. Roman Vishniak is going exploring. His search is to take him no farther than the nearby seashore. For there is, in the oceans which cover three quarters of the Earth, a teeming water world whose tiny inhabitants are counted by the quadrillions. Dr. Vishniak is the world's leading photographer of microscopic life. He is a scientist and a philosopher with doctorates in zoology and medicine, and he speaks eight languages. But his first love is discovering nature through photography, bringing to view infinitesimal ocean organisms like these mollusk embryos. At magnifications ranging from 100 to 6,000 times, Dr. Vishniak explores mysteries of life far beyond human vision. Notice the heartbeat of this single mollusk embryo as, like a baby chick, it waits to hatch from its egg. The opportunities for exploration are as limitless as the sea. And so, off Woods Hole on the Massachusetts coast, the 59-year-old doctor spryly carries his search for saltwater specimens out into the bay. This time he uses a net within a net to strain only the tiniest water dwellers into his jar. Although virtually invisible, they are looked upon by Dr. Vishniak as friends, deserving of civilized consideration. Some people think microscopic animals are all alike, he says, but oh no, they have individualities that make them different from one another, just like human beings. And photographing the milky living dust collected in his jar, he shows what he means. Helter-skelter inhabitants called cyclops are among the busiest of Dr. Vishniak's neighbors in the water world. Tentacles flare out from their bodies like horns from a steer. And like the giant cyclops in Greek mythology, they have but a single eye. When a crab moves into the picture, the cyclops are in deadly peril for they are a favorite food of larger animals. Quicker than the eye can see, the crab snatches and swallows the helpless cyclops. Here before our eyes is a life and death struggle seen through the microscope, recorded by the motion picture camera. But the cyclops multiply faster than they are destroyed to continue the cycle of life in the sea. For Dr. Vishniak, sea life is where you find it. It can be clinging to the shell of a horseshoe crab, the crab, strange as it seems, chews its food with its feet, and when released, always, seemingly by instinct, scurries toward the open sea. The Oceanographic Institution on the New England coast is a workshop for students of marine life. Dr. Vishniak comes here often with specimens he has collected from the sea. One is a smaller horseshoe crab. With the utmost of care, he scrapes off a tiny flatworm before photographing it in undreamed of detail. Looking like a floating pancake, the flatworm is actually demonstrating the rhythmic motion it uses to travel. When it wants free transportation, the flatworm conveniently attaches itself to the horseshoe crab. Watch the hermit crab take cover. The crab is snug in its shell as the doctor removes other living specimens with the skill of a surgeon. Only living creatures, he insists, can be photographed truthfully, thus making possible an accurate report of their appearance and behavior. For Dr. Vishniak, who was seven when he took his first microphotograph, the task requires intricate equipment and incredible patience. The bristle worm, for example, is constantly twisting and turning, ducking and dodging. And yet somehow the doctor manages to keep it in focus. Dr. Vishniak says, no creature is simple. Here is proof. The bristle worm, unbelievably complex under the microscope, yet tinier than a pinhead. All the time, the bristles move in and out, barely visible even under magnification. Dr. Vishniak's amazing technique takes us inside the worm, just like an x-ray. This is a barnacle hunting food. 
Sweeping in and out of its shell, six pairs of feathery legs form a casting net to capture tiny creatures swimming past. Dr. Vishniak achieves an almost third dimensional realism in photographing another underwater worm. There is a growing fascination in watching the frantic convolutions of the minute organism as it takes the shape of an unending pretzel. Although separated from our everyday world only by a set of lenses, here is a form of animal life whose complex and unending movements are unlike anything that has ever been seen by the unaided human eye. Next, an amphrotite bursts into view, its plumage as bright as holiday streamers. Dr. Vishniak's own intricate lighting system helps capture the full beauty of one of the loveliest creatures of the sea. Body and streamers shine with iridescent splendor. Photographing a world most of us didn't know existed, Dr. Vishniak presents its inhabitants in brilliant glory. He returns his specimens alive to their homes. Just because they are small, he says, doesn't mean they have no rights. Water, what wonders it holds for Dr. Roman Vishniak, explorer of the world within the sea.